Salutations, respective viewers. Uh, I'm George from Ireland. So I'm outside um, Lord Salisbury's house. Now, obviously a number of people have borne that great title, but I'm talking, talking about um, the third Marquis of Salisbury, uh, who was Prime Minister. So um, the Cecil family had been prominent since um, the reign of Elizabeth I, and so some of the longer established nobility looked down on the Cecils as being only very middle class nobility, because some of them had had these noble titles for longer than that. Um, so there were the two brothers, William Cecil and Robert Cecil, who both uh, attained preferment under the Virgin Queen. Um, anyway, so they were, they were ennobled as um, Baron Salisbury because they had most of their, most of their um, estates uh, around that cathedral city in Western England and then raised to um, Earl Salisbury, finally to Marquess of Salisbury because you might know in the table of ranks, noble titles go like this. There's Baron, then Viscount, then Earl, then Marquess, then Duke. Uh, one person can hold several titles. Anyway, so um, R1, uh, he's, uh, their, their surname was Gascoigne Cecil by that stage, as in G-A-S-C-O-Y-N-E. Was he a distant relation of, of, of Gaza, Paul Gascoigne, that notorious Geordie footballer? I'm not quite sure. But obviously the surname um, Gascoigne, it indicates that their, that their ancestors came from Gascony, as in southwest France, many centuries before. Well, actually with um, William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, who was bastard by name and by nature, but that's another story. Um, so our Lord Salisbury, um, he went to Eton and then he went to Oxford University. Going to Eton was seen to be almost uh, almost compulsory for um, aristocrats of that uh, status, um, and he was indeed a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. So at Oxford University, then there were about 20 colleges. So Oxford University is a federal system, if you will, uh, as in the university be like the federal government, or the colleges be like the states. And and having graduated, um, uh, the best undergraduates in each year are um, invited to sit an exam for All Souls, which had been found in 1451 by Henry the Sixth. To, to um, pray for the repose of the souls of all the soldiers killed in the Hundred Years' War between England and France. Um, so the best two from Oriental Studies and the best two from History, the best two from Classics and the best two from Modern Languages and so forth would try out for all souls. And then of those, there might be sort of 20, 30 undergraduates going for it or graduates, they just graduated, two would be chosen each year. And then for seven years, they were prized fellows of All Souls. They'd have a stipend, they'd have a room in All Souls, you know, bed and board, and they'd have to do any work. They could do some teaching, they could do some publishing they wanted, or they could do nothing at all, but that was theirs. And nothing was required in return. But some of them were London, as they say, would, would go to London and practice, pursue a career there, often at the bar, possibly as a man of letters, or indeed in the, in the, in the, the church, and it would be the established church in those days, they would do it. And, um, in politics, anything like that, or just go home and run the estate. Um, or they could stay at Oxford and really be dons, but after seven years that was up. Now there are other ways to become fellows, fellows of all souls. So it's, it's um, um, the most extraordinary academic accolade in this country. It's a little bit like becoming part of l'Académie Française in France, although of course being a prize fellow of all souls is not for life. Um, there is something different obviously that you could be a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, but that's only if you're in a certain field. Um, anyway, so that, that was Lord Salisbury. So he was a Tory of the old school and he was a, more or less reactionary, um, was dead against um, the Second Reform Act, um, didn't like Benjamin Disraeli very much, who was of the leader of the party for a while, but had to rub along with him. So somehow had to, had to accept changes he disliked. Um, and he, he, he looked down on the proletariat, um, saying that they were characterized by um, vulgarity, venality, drunkenness. Well, these are a few of my favorite things, and I'm uh, extraordinarily working class. Anyway, um, and he, he did dislike um, having to campaign. He, he despised democracy. He didn't like having to um, shake hands with the grimy wife and the sluttish daughter. And he was revolted by the wholesale deglutition of uh, insincere promises. Well, that's politics. So, uh, of course, when he was an infant, um, only about 5% of men had been permitted to vote. So only the propertied classes. And he thought it was much better like that. And constituencies were, were ridiculously um, inegalitarian in terms of size, or population as well as territorial scope. And he, there was no way they were going to go back to that. So 
Then uh, from the 1880s, there have been the slogan, Tory democracy, invented by Lord Randolph Churchill, as in Father of Winston. But in private, Lord Randolph Ch Churchill admitted it was opportunism, mostly. Oh, I think you can forget about the mostly. It was sheer opportunism. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so this was, this was um, uh, Lord Salisbury. Um, but he, he nevertheless served in the cabinet under um, Binyamin Disraeli, though he didn't like him over much, the Earl of Beaconsfield, a parvenu as he saw it. Um, because he wasn't, he wasn't grand enough, he wasn't from blue blood and broad acres. I don't think he was anti-Semitic though actually, Lord Salisbury, I could be wrong. So um, then he realised he had to appeal to, to um, people who had not previously had the vote, to some working class voters and to some lower middle class voters. So invent, invented, um, well, you know, uh, this Tory brand of jingoism, imperialism, like we don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do, we've got the men, we've got the guns and we've got, I can't remember what it is, the ships too. Um, uh, the Russians must not have Constantinople. That famous song from 1878, this, um, uh, so music hall patriotism, music hall being the most popular form of mass entertainment at the time in theatres up and down the country, is gloriously intellectually unchallenging. Um, when there's talk about um, the Russian Empire wanting to seize um, <coughs> Constantinople, we now call it Istanbul, from the Ottoman Empire, and get permanent access to the Mediterranean, a warm water port. And the United Kingdom wouldn't stand for that, was going to support the sublime port, uh, support the unspeakable Turk, as many people saw it, against um, the Ruskies. Um, anyway, Russia, Russia backed down. Um, so some people thought that was a good thing. Uh, <coughs> so appeal to the working class through flag waving um, <clears throat> and some policies that helped them a little bit but that was more Benjamin Disraeli's doing than his doing. Um, so he was Prime Minister when the British Empire was at its zenith and that's why um, when um, <coughs> what's now Zimbabwe became part of the British Empire the capital was initially named Salisbury in honour of Lord Salisbury. It's now of course called Harare. Um, and uh, so that was that. But uh, he managed to get himself into a conflict against um, uh, against um, the uh, Africana republics, the Transvaal Republic and the Orania Freistaat. Um, I don't want to go too much into the minutiae of it, but it's all about voting rights for Oitlanders, as in foreigners who moved into these countries. Obviously, the black majority in both countries were, were deprived of any political rights. Now, I know they had parallel political and judicial structures, but uh, if they ever collided with a white man's world, the whites, their, their law took precedence. <clears throat> so um, they had racist constitutions. I, I think it was the constitution of the Transvaal saying there should be no equality in church and state between black and white. Obviously whites um, being in the saddle in those days and um, really uh, demanding black people do this, not be allowed to do that, have to carry passes and so forth. Um, anyway, so uh, how, when Britons moved into these republics, were they to get the vote after 12 years residency or should it be five years or should it be nine years? And there was all sorts of wrangling about that, moving more troops into this country, <coughs> into the, the, the fully British parts of South Africa, the Cape Colony and Natal and so forth. Um, so the Transvaal Republic and the Orange Free State had recognized British paramountcy. Well, what's that? It's a nebulous term, perhaps deliberately so, constructive ambiguity <coughs> to um, end the four, First Boer War, a rare British defeat in 1880. But anyway, the Germans had sold Mausers, these new smokeless rifles, to the Afrikaner Republics, as in the, the, the descendants of 17th century Dutch immigrants, mostly. So October 19, 1899, they issued their ultimatum to uh, the British authorities to remove all troops that entered South Africa since March that year. And London said, well, no way, you're part of the British Empire anyway, and you can't order us where to, where to station our troops. Um, we're allowed to deploy them wherever we wish. Anyway, so battle c commenced. So quite soon, some, some easy early victories for the British Army, but then it became a lot more difficult and some sieges and mafeking. And, and then there was Black Week, three, three, three defeats in one week. And when mafeking was finally relieved, there were people celebrated with mafeking. And for some, for some uh, decades after that, mafeking meant rapturous celebration. And then it got into a sort of a partisan campaign and a scorched earth campaign, blockhouses and barbed wire, <coughs> and um, um, Africana civilians and their black servants sometimes put in the, these um, uh, concentration camps. Now, not a single person was killed there, forced to work, but a lot of them died from disease, from insanitary conditions. Sometimes they, didn't, they weren't even given soap. Now, a lot of the, the, the supply convoys by train were being destroyed by the Afrikaner forces. So a lot of British soldiers died of illness and insanitary conditions as well. 
and the population in Africana is very diffuse living on farms and where you get people who are living in very small communities and put them together in a camp with tens of thousands of people often their immune system can't take it coming into contact with the, the illnesses of other people so a lot of people died in these camps and it was it was, it was quite an outcry about the time so finally the Africana signed the peace of Vereniging um, and they, they surrendered in return for a fairly generous settlement money to help rebuild their farms and in 1910 in 1910 South Africa was going to get, um, uh, get self-governance again. Um, the Union of South Africa would be created. Um, so the, the, the various, the four main provinces, the Cape Colony, KwaZulu-Natal, the Orange Free State and, and, and Transvaal united. Um, but crucially, it said that native affairs, as in the rights of the black majority, would be decided by South Africa itself and not by London, as in um, the white minority in South Africa was less inclined to acknowledge the rights of uh, the black uh, community than London was, though white supremacist Nostra were, were widespread in the white world at the time. Um, anyway, so just after he'd finally achieved that, a, a, a fairly inglorious victory, it should have been a walkover, um, he resigned, he was infirm by this stage, and um, he managed to shoehorn his nephew, Arthur James B Balfour, into office, who'd also been to uh, Eton and Oxford. So um, Lord Salisbury died the following year. But um, his family remained prominent in politics, uh, well, well, till quite recent times, actually. And it was his grandson, known as Bobberty, that, that Lord Salisbury came up with the Salisbury Convention right after the Second World War, saying that uh, he was a conservative, of course, and um, the Labour government <coughs> was in office. Now, the House of Lords had the right to delay things for up to two years in those days. But if things were in the Labour manifesto, then the, then the House of Lords would not delay it. And there's that again. It's, it's pertinent even today, with uh, Boris Johnson wanting to withdraw the United Kingdom from the European Union by the 31st of January. Now, it's not always been observe, observe, observed in the last Parliament. Sometimes the House of Lords has inflicted defeats on the government over its Brexit programme. But the, the, the Salisbury Convention is just that. It's a convention. It's not a law. They are legally entitled to do so. But it's, it's, it's breaking this gentleman's agreement. And obviously, Labour peers have also observed it, well, until recent times, in relation to Tory governments. So, um, uh, anyway, the Parliament Act of 1949 reduced the House of Peers' uh, ability to delay legislation to one year. You know, the House of Commons can invoke the Parliament Act to rush things through, but the Commons usually doesn't want to irritate the Lords, doesn't want to have to invoke the Parliament Act. It tends to disrupt the legislative timetable. They've often got quite a packed schedule of legislation to get through. But back to, back to the Marcus of Salisbury. The Labour Party was very minor in his lifetime, and um, then um, he... Uh, uh, he, he saw it rising, but described socialism as a creed beyond the pale of human tolerance. So um, he was a very clever man, but often gave the, tried to give the impression of being dim and unthreatening. And uh, he realised he needed to use the Daily Mail and Daily Express, which had only just been founded, to try and appeal to more of the working class villa Tories. But he really looked down at these tabloids written by office boys, for office boys, um, and so forth. Um, so completely out, out of sympathy with Labour and even the Liberals' ideas of, of, of um, the, the, the beginnings of a welfare state. Perhaps it's uh, curiously ironic that the um, Mozambican High Commission should be here, obviously a former Portuguese colony uh, that, joined the, that joined the Commonwealth nonetheless. And uh, it was critical in the, in the um, Second South African War, that's 1899 to 1902, or the Defeat of Urloch, as um, our um, Afrikaner confrere would call it because um, um, the Africana Republic has been shipping things in via um, what was then Portuguese East Africa via the port of Lorenzo Marx we now know as as um, Maputo and indeed that's how, where Churchill escaped um, from from Boer captivity uh, so it could have could have gone either way but um, Lord Salisbury he thought that um, he thought that the Portuguese Empire might soon collapse and eventually the UK and Germany agreed to carve up the Portuguese Empire if that did it, because Portugal was in a pre Portugal was in a pre-revolutionary state. They overthrew one king, and then they just overthrew the monarchy, all, monarchy altogether. Well, that's enough about um, uh, uh, Lord Salisbury, as he's known, the third Marcus of Salisbury, Viscount Cranbourne. His great grandson was the Tory leader of the House of Lords under William Hague. I remember 20 years ago, well, just over 20 years ago, I was the second last sitting of the day of all the hereditary peers, because of course until Tony Blair. The hereditary peers, all, all 800 of them, had the right to be in the House of Lords. That was taken away. Stage one of House of Lords reform. Labour's never got to stage two. No one's ever come up with a coherent plan for stage two of Lords reform. And so this man's great-grandson was 
that went behind William Hague's back to try and to strike a deal with Tony Blair to keep 89 hereditary, hereditary peers there in the House of Lords, and that's still the case. The um, strange thing is the only person, the only people ever elected to the House of Lords are hereditary peers, because when one hereditary peer dies, the other hereditary peers are allowed to elect a replacement. But anyway, Tony Blair got rid of nine out of 10 hereditary peers. One of his other great grandson, Lord, oh, I can't remember his name, Lord something or the Cecil, he was indeed killed in Zimbabwe in um, uh, 1978, if I got that right, April 1978. He went to Eton, of course, was a guards officer and was there supposedly as a journalist, but really fighting for the white supremacist regime. Young Winston, as he was called, somewhat contemptuously by other journalists, going to cover events but, but carrying loads of guns. He was a sort of Tory candidate for some constituency other, was due to stand at the 1979 election, but obviously he got killed by Zanma or Zipra um, before he had a chance to stand for parliament. The younger brother of um, Viscount Cranbourne, well, the man is now Marcus of Salisbury, about the seventh of Marcus of Salisbury. So um, that is a brief overview of this most distinguished and colorful dynasty. That's enough about Lord Salisbury.